Well, when we started putting this uh, conference together, I, I went back to my old habits of putting on our marketing conferences, because that's, that's one of the things that we have to understand about winning this election. It's about marketing. It's about branding. It's about the way George Bush, in the 2004 election, we will, was able to get 45% of the Latino vote. It wasn't by accident. It wasn't because he sat in Austin, Texas, and said, well, they're good people. They, they, they'll wake up one morning and say, I'm going to go vote for this guy. No, he spent money on the thing. He focused branding, messaging, advocates. It's a big story, the Viva Bush campaign. But it proves one thing. We can do it. We can get these voters. And, and George was passionate about it. So now, the first thing we thought about is, let's find out the Latinos in the Midwest are the fastest growing population in the country. They're actually changing the face of the Midwest. So I wanted to bring in a, a marketing expert to launch us off today, to put it in a marketing perspective. Who, who is this community? And I reached out to a good friend of mine, Nancy Hernandez. Nancy is the president and founder of Abrazo Multicultural Marketing and Communication. Abrazo, by the way, means a good hug. So let's, let's all hug here. Come on. Let's get it. And uh, she has offices in Milwaukee and El Paso, Texas. And uh, she's uh, had more than 10 years experience in marketing experience, a master's degree in business administration from Marquette University. She currently serves on the Council of Small Business Executives, Hispanic Professionals of Greater Milwaukee, uh, University of Wisconsin Milwaukee Board of Visitors, Milwaukee Public Library Foundation Board, and the Wisconsin Hispanic Conduit. She formerly sat on the board of the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce in Wisconsin and also has been a business leader and a marketing leader in this country. Let's give a warm Minnesota welcome to Nancy Hernandez. somewhere, I remember, and there was a, someone um, collecting signatures, something political when I was a kid, and uh, I remember them asking my mom and going, what? You can't vote? <laughs> because, you know, they asked her, and she's like, well, does it matter if I can't vote? And they're like, oh, yeah, no, you can't sign that. Um, but that was the first time that, that I remember knowing that, oh, there's people here who can't vote. She didn't get to go vote like my dad did. But all of us kind of know some people that fit that profile, right? Hispanics can't vote. How about the second part of this piece? If they can vote, they don't vote. I see a couple hands, more hands shooting up. So we definitely know Hispanics that fit that profile as well, right? Maybe they aren't engaged. Maybe they're fed up. Maybe they don't believe in the system, just don't believe in voting. And certainly the color isn't the only issue there. I not only know Hispanics that fit that profile, I know Caucasians that fit that profile, Asians that fit that profile, African Americans, Native Americans, etc., etc. So that second statement is colorblind. And that's also a sad trend, because these people are picking up their ball and going home. And I don't know about you guys, but my mom told me that that was never the right option to do. Anecdotally speaking, however, because we are here to talk about the Latino vote, I can say that the pool of Hispanics that I know that fit this second trend, that choose not to vote, is getting smaller and smaller. And I'm willing to bet that many of you, that's true for many of you in the audience as well. And how do I know that? Because I'm a numbers girl and the numbers support that. So I want to dive in. 
I'm going to give you plenty of numbers today. And the first one I'm going to give you is 23.7 million. It's not a small one. I hope you enter coffee. Um, anyone know what that is? 23.7 million? It's the number of eligible Hispanic voters in this country, 23.7 million. So if we were playing a big game of four square right now, that's how many people we could rotate into our game, right? So we'd have a really fun, long day. So let's see if we can start to dive in and dispel these two myths. Uh, the fact is, 11.1 million Hispanics voted in 2011. 11.1 million. To help put that in perspective, that is more than the population of the Dominican Republic, or more than the total population of Uruguay, Panama, and Puerto Rico combined. 11.1 million. A lot of votes. There is more to that number, though, than meets the eye. And so how do we start? If I were Joe Snuffy, not the fantastic marketing analyzer that I am, and I was looking for Hispanic votes in the U.S., if I was looking for some of these 11.1 million votes, where would I go? How would you start that? Where would you go? Arizona, Arizona California. Arizona, California, right? Yeah. Oh, sorry, I'm going back. I'm too fast for myself. This is so much fun. Um, it's probably the same places that many of the other major corporations go, right? Rick knows this all too well. Texas, California, Florida, you guys certainly said the usual suspects. And I'm not saying that those Hispanic votes don't matter. That is not what we were talking about today. We all remember being glued to our TVs and the hanging chants and the Florida vote and et cetera and, and other instances where the Hispanic vote in these key states and these big Hispanic obvious states have played a role in our nation's politics. But today we want to make the case for something that isn't so intuitive. That's a layer deeper than the obvious. And because you guys have had your copy, I think you can handle it. Um, but one that I truly believe was sustained investment and cultivation can heighten the role that Hispanics play in our nation's politics for the GOP. So, let's dive in. According to Gallup and many other established, reputable analyzers, you probably hear this, especially on presidential election cycles, you have heard for the past 20 some years, there's something along these lines. The Midwest is the most competitive region and usually backs the eventual winner. Has any, have you guys heard something like that? Remember hearing that, right? So what does that statement mean? It means that other states in the nation, they're those with the obvious Hispanic populations, are more historic in their voting patterns. They lean a certain way as a block. It doesn't mean that we don't pay attention to them or that they're not important. As a matter of fact, for uh, those candidates who need to count on those votes to win, it plays a very important role. But what this statement also says, and what we know is true, is that the margin of winning in the Midwest is smaller. The historic voting pattern of our states is less predictable. And that is what puts states like ours in the headlines and in the front lines of the background each and every major election. We are the most competitive region, and every vote really does count so much more. In effect, the Midwest has got game. So let's look at some macro trends. Now, some of you probably are also math people like me, right? Who did the math in their heads when I threw out those two numbers before? You probably thought to yourself, well, 23.7 million eligible Hispanic voters, 11.1 million Hispanic <coughs> votes. That leaves 12.6 million who didn't vote, right? Who stayed home. Um, less than 50%. Right? So at first glance, we're like, well, let's just 
go home today, right? No, let's dig a little deeper. So if we just look at the period between 2008 and 2012, let's look a little deeper at that 11.1%. This chart shows the difference in voter turnout by race and ethnicity between 2008 and 2012. And by the way, I say race and ethnicity because Hispanic isn't the same as saying black, Asian, or African American. 14.8% um, more Hispanics voted between those two elections. This isn't more, 14.8% more Hispanics voted just in that four year period. Only the Asian voter growth rate was higher. And for Asians, that meant an increase of half a million votes. That's pretty good. For Hispanics, that resulted in one and a half million more votes between 2008 and 2012. Understand the term sleeping giant, where that's starting to come from? Not just, on the not just on the political trend, but in many aspects of Latino life in the United States. So if we start drilling down further, now this is national, if I start drilling down further, what do you think, when we look at our competitive Midwest, what is that going to say? So let's look at the Midwest. Since we are in the great state of Minnesota, let's start here. Let's give you Minnesotans a hand, right? Because this is a fantastic number. You guys are really overachievers. <laughs> if we look at the last decade, 368% increase in Latino voters in this state. By far, one of the highest. That brings their estimated numbers to close to 90,000 votes. And I want to remind you that in 2008, the Senate race was lost by the Republican Party for only 312 votes. And the presidential race was only lost by 225,000 votes. That, let's also mention local estate elections that each year and every year are won and lost on margins much smaller than this block of Latino voters. And now you begin to see how they can play a very big, important numeric part of that numerical puzzle. Let's visit some of our other Midwestern neighbors. How about, well, Iowa didn't get to go first this morning, but we'll go to them next. Double digit growth right here and a block of 61,000 eligible Hispanic voters. In 2004, Bush won by only a margin of 10,000 votes here. Let's go, <clears throat> let's go to Indiana next. Also strong growth rate, 67% here. Doesn't touch you Minnesotans. I'm glad somebody said Minnesotans earlier because I did not know how to say that correctly. So. <laughs> 38,000 eligible voters. In 2008, GOP lost this state by a block of 28,000 votes. Let's go a little bit further north. Michigan. What's happening in Michigan? 171,000 eligible Latino voters. Good number. 66% growth rate. Also good number. 2004 was lost here by 165,000 votes. Always talk about Ohio, right? We can't not talk about Ohio. 128,000 eligible Latino voters in Ohio. Some of the margins and wins and losses in that state, always typically in the headlines, 166,000 or a loss in the 2012 presidential election. In 2010, however, a gubernatorial win, which is helping change the national agenda today by only 77,000 votes. How important was the Hispanic vote here? So we can go 
over more Midwestern states, but I think you are beginning to get the picture. The Midwest has game, right? Now you kind of get it a little. We, more than any other part of the United States, have swing voters and independent voters that are keeping elections guessing at all levels. An important part of that mix is the Latino voter, both by numbers and by independence of mind. A couple smirks out there. Some of you might be saying to yourself at this point, Nancy, come on. Maybe you make the case for some uh, numerical reasons why the Latino vote is important in elections, but surely I have to know, right? I'm the marketing person. I have to know that Latinos vote. What do they vote? Don't. Or do they don't, right? But when they do, what do they vote? Democrat. Democrat, right? This has to be going through your head. It has to. I mean, you're probably also thinking it's, it's a problem that there's these high growth rates. What are you going to do? Because that means that the voting population in those states is more democratic, right? So we shouldn't have voter registration efforts in these communities. We, shouldn't act, we should actively redistrict some of them. We should figure out how to stop this run on votes for Democrats. Some of you might be thinking that a little bit back in your head. Well, let's do one last state visit. The great state of Wisconsin, who has the privilege, of course, of being Minnesota's neighbor, and see if we can address that for you. Wisconsin. 96,000 eligible voters, 23% growth rate in the last decade. In 2012, we lost the state by 213,000 votes. But in 2004, we only lost the state by 11,000 votes. This is something I am intimately familiar with because uh, Abrazo, my firm, um, was working hand in hand in this election with the Latino community and RPW, Republican Party of Wisconsin, throughout the state well in advance of election year to work on those numbers. We did do voter registration. We also spent a lot of time talking up front about issues and similarities, not candidates. And the Hispanic turnout for in that 2004 election for Bush, 48%. So let me tell you what I mean about issues and similarities, not candidates. Why? So my dad, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my family today. My dad is a lecturer. I don't mean he goes out and gives speeches or teaches at a university. I mean that he is the oldest in a family of 13. Hispanic. And so, of course, his job is to give guidance and advice. Everybody's got one of these in their family, right? And he does this very, very, very well. Even now, 43, even now, I drive a Mini Cooper. Love my Mini Cooper. My dad thinks it's too small, not safe enough, not impressive enough. Now, I just, I fell in love with it. I fell in love with it when I was a kid. I took a trip to Europe, fell in love with the Mini Cooper. That's why I drive a Mini Cooper. They're pretty safe and sturdy, as a matter of fact. They made my BMW. They have the full airbag wall around me. Um, but none of that matters. So for 11 years now, another testament to the Mini Cooper, that I've had that car, my dad takes every opportunity he can get to tell me how small and unsafe it is. Does that sound familiar? So guess what I do? Is it all good kids do? I tune it out, right? I hear either that specific tone in his voice or a specific set of circumstances, like I'm picking him up in the car, or a specific word that's my trigger, that I know he's going to start talking about me and my car yet again. Tune it out. And I smile, and I nod, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But I don't really listen to a gosh darn thing he's saying, right? Well, guys, I'm here to tell you, we have turned into my 
down <laughs> for much of the Latino population. We have. Is in our typical approach, it is in our typical words, it is in our typical circumstances that triggers that Latino vote tuning us out. Many of you can probably name some of those triggers, like we always come in election time only, always full of similar rhetoric, always includes the one that I personally love, especially as a marketer, the 25 bold and underlined words in our mailings, right? We have to have that. It's part of our thing. But it doesn't have to be that way. And the benefits can be very much like it was in 2004, 48% turnout, Hispanic turnout in Wisconsin, turning out for President Bush and helping to slim down that margin with a spitting distance of victory. Next time, it can be a winner. There is approach and method, message and tactic that can help our party connect with Hispanic motor, voter and make a difference in elections. You guys have taken a great first step. And that's coming in the horse's mouth. You have given us the opportunity to help drive that message and tactic, give us the opportunity to take that to the population, give us the opportunity to own the approach and adapt to what we share, we will share with you what will work. And I'm excited, and I've heard, actually, I've even heard some wonderful things today. I've heard exciting things um, about uh, a voter guide in churches that I'm going to take back to Wisconsin. And we'll be able to share in some of the panel uh, later today, share some things that we're doing in Wisconsin, coordinating with some of the public or the uh, party efforts, statewide efforts that include technology and include social media. And I'm also excited because we have the most fertile ground right here in the Midwest. Much of what you are going to hear about today will give you thoughts on how that might come together. My job was to set up and frame the opportunity. But I also want to give you just a small glimpse. You know, some of you might look at me and say, well, okay, you haven't really told us much yet. You've told us that definitely we got the numbers the metrics and how these can play an important role and maybe we kind of believe you about okay if we let go of some of these thoughts that we have that we have the opportunity to convert some of these voters and I'm still not understanding how so I want to give you a small glimpse as to why I know that a connection with the Latino voter can and will occur and to do that, I want to go over to my story. This is me and my five-year-old doing a typical Wisconsin thing, right? Uh, lake in lake, Bear Lake in Manaqua. Fun weekend fishing and all kinds of things that Hispanics are notorious for doing, right? Um, so what I want to share from here is a singular perspective. That of a conservative Hispanic. A conservative Hispanic, mind you, who votes, donates, volunteers, and organizes. A perspective that I think many of you here in this room are interested in understanding and one that I think is ever so important to the future of the Republican Party. So what is this perspective grounded in? What makes me not unique, mind you, but common to many other conservative Hispanics? I would have to say that my perspective was most shaped by occurrences 2,000 miles away in Monterey, Mexico. I'm not from Mexico. I was born in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I played baseball growing up. I listened to some of the things that maybe some of you are in my age group, like Depeche Mode, David Bowie, Tears for Fears. <laughs> Sound familiar? Just like all of my classmates at Rufus King High School, which in urban Milwaukee. But my parents were from Mexico. My dad from Monterrey and my mom from a tiny town near Guadalajara. And what shaped my perspective most is the fact that my dad only had a sixth grade education. 
He came from a large family. He was the oldest. And they didn't have money to do many things, like buy all the kids shoes. Thirteen kids need a lot of shoes. So my dad was without much of it in his view. And so much so that ever since he was old enough, and old enough and here for us might mean 15, maybe somebody's doing something at 14 or 16 or 17, but for him, old enough was eight or nine years old. He would take his shoe shine kit, walk downtown, and go to work shining shoes. Now, that was quite a few miles away, like five. He didn't do this for spending money. He didn't do it to just buy himself the things that he needed for school or whatnot, like shoes. He did it to help support the rest of the family. He used to share some stories with me some days about how he would be so tired and he couldn't walk back home, so he would just, he would, you know, spend some of his earnings that day to take a cab back home. It was a long walk. But, you know, he said the times that he chose to do that were just so few and far between because he felt guilty because it pretty much cost him everything that he would make that day. And he knew the family needed the money, so he would take the trip. <coughs> he would also talk about a candy store that he had um, that, that was by the house where they lived and how he could never afford to buy anything. So... Um, he definitely wouldn't use any of the money that he made because that he turned over to the family. So, you know, he enjoyed candy by standing on the outside and staring in and looking at the candy. So imagine the discipline and work ethic in that young man that grew to become my father. Raised in Monterey, Mexico. But he was born in Fond du Lac, Wisconsin. And so when he was old enough, he came back to Wisconsin to do the same thing that he had done in Mexico, work to send money home for the family. He eventually met my mother there, had three kids, I'm the youngest. He worked in tanneries. He also went to school for auto body repair, and he wound up working in an auto body shop and then eventually owned his own auto body shop for many years located in the Hispanics outside of Milwaukee, did very well, and he sold that and retired. So, you know, I share that with you because I want you to understand that I grew up immersed in themes, many of which you have already heard from some of the people that spoke today who are not Hispanic, right? Family, education, duty, hard work, morals, responsibility, Choosing difficult rights over easier wrongs. Most importantly, opportunity. These are all the themes that shaped me. These are the themes that shaped my conservative Hispanic perspective. So I'm sharing that with you today because if you recall when I started talking about why I'm so certain I stated earlier that my perspective was not a unique one. Most of the time when people are talking, they flip flop that, right? It was a common one. My experience wasn't unique. It was common. The tale I shared with you today is the same tale that my cousins will tell. It's the same if we went to you, your local Hispanic grocery store right at this minute, pulled people coming in and out of there. It's the same tale that they would tell. Not just Mexicans, Ecuadorians, Argentinians, Venezuelans, Paraguayans, they would share that same story with you as well. As I'm sure those of you in the Hispanic or that are Hispanic in the audience today might share similar tales. And the themes of duty and family and responsibility and hard work are not just the themes of conservative Hispanics. Then, they are the themes 
of Hispanics. Period. Just Hispanics. Not 10%, not 33%, not, not, a, not a 50% even, but an overwhelming majority threshold of Hispanics will share that same tale and are rooted in those same perspectives. So keep that in mind is why I am so optimistic and why I now can be God. My birthday falls on November 4th every year. Every few years. Every few years. I get the privilege to blow out my birthday candles and wish for a positive outcome on the presidential election, because as many of you guessed, my birthday falls on election day every so often, on November 4th. So the first time I did that was for this guy right here. And so let's remember his quote, right? Latinos are Republican. They just don't know it yet. Yeah. Right? So um, I hope, I want to thank you for you know, letting me open today and certainly Rick and the crew here for inviting me. Um, I will also be part of the panel today as well and um, can share, look forward to sharing some specific tactics, approaches, and strategies that we have used in Wisconsin. I look forward to learning from some of that here as well. But I hope that I painted a picture today that shows you that certainly the opportunity is there, especially in the Midwest, to make a key difference in the politics of the nation and certainly our local and state elections as well. And that the opportunity is also there from a messaging standpoint because this statement couldn't be true. <coughs> So I'll open it up to any questions. Do we have time for a couple questions if there are well, any? You know, I, I think we'll have time at, 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 at the end. Our perfect. General, we're going to go right with the panel, so we want everybody to stay put and bring the panel way up. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you.